Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. Community leaders invited the media onto the James Smith Cree Nation to talk about the ongoing impacts of the mass murder there. Our APTN team was on site all week. We go now to our Saskatoon reporter Priscilla Wolf with the latest. So good to see you, Priscilla. You know, yourself, Tamara Pimentel, Leon, San Leon Sanders were on the ground at James Smith Cree Nation yesterday, all week, in fact. Uh, what was happening there today? You know, there's wakes, there's grieving, media has been asked to leave and give space. Just give us an idea of where things are at there now. Well, Melissa, yes, we were on the community all week, and, and yesterday the media was invited as community leadership and uh, family members spoke to the media. They, they did politely ask us to leave, and mm -hmm. what you could see was they were setting up for the wakes and the funerals, and they did have, you know, um, ceremonies set up as well. And, you know, we're respecting their privacy, so we mm -hmm. know that they have already started their grieving, yeah. and that's what I think is happening right now. Hopefully other media did the same. You know, I'm, I'm curious how many people are still recovering in the hospital from Sunday stabbings? Do we know that? Well, the Saskatchewan Health Authority released some information this afternoon saying that as of now there are eight patients in the hospitals here in Saskatchewan and that they are in stable condition. So it, it went down, like I think it was on Wednesday, they said nine mm -hmm. and there were two in critical condition. So that's, you know, there have been improvements and um, since Sunday, nine have been discharged. Okay, this is good to know. You know, how are community members mm -hmm. and leadership dealing now? Like last you saw, well, last we saw, they were telling us that they're really focusing on their mental health. They're reaching out to elders, as well as nearby community members who are helping as much as they can, whether it's with food or resources. So they're helping each other and being very supportive because we know it's, you know, it's a very difficult time. So they're doing the best they can, helping each other and also accepting help from nearby community members. Well, great to talk with you, Priscilla. Awesome work to yourself, to Leanne, to Tamara. Uh, thank you guys so much for everything you did out there, bringing this horrible story to our APTN audience, but in a very well done, responsible way. Okay, thank you. Well, some Indigenous leaders and organizations are reacting to Queen Elizabeth's death yesterday. The Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs and Assembly of First Nations both expressed condolences in a joint statement. We are two sovereign nations who come together to honour the treaties between us and we look forward to working with the new king as treaty partners, stated the AMC Deputy Grand Chief Cornell McLean. Assembly of First Nations Manitoba Regional Chief Cindy Woodhouse expressed similar thoughts. As sovereign nations, First Nations in the treaty territories located in Manitoba greatly value the sacred treaty relationship with the British Crown. Governor General Mary Simon said the Queen inspired many. Her Majesty the Queen was, in equal measures, compassionate, dedicated, humble, engaged and wise. She believed in service to her people above all and inspired so many with her dedication to the Crown. Just days before her passing, the Queen shared her final public statement. It was regarding the tragedy on the James Smith Cree Nation, saying, I would like to extend my condolences to those who have lost loved ones in the attacks that occurred this past weekend in Saskatchewan. My thoughts and prayers are with those recovering from injuries and grieving such horrific losses. Well, the Union of British Columbia Indian Chiefs also released a statement today in part saying that King Charles should renounce England's support of the Doctrine of Discovery and change the Crown's approach to Indigenous sovereignty. Well, the first official rendition of God Save the King has been performed. The song closed the memorial service held at St. Paul's Cathedral in honor of the Queen. God Save the King was last sung in 1952 before the Queen took the throne. Crowds also spontaneously broke into the anthem when the King first arrived at Buckingham Palace. Uh, Saturday is World Suicide Prevention Day and today the National Inuit Youth Council held an event on Parliament Hill to draw greater attention to that issue. Fraser Needham was there. The numbers are alarming. According to Inuit Taprit Kanatami statistics, suicide rates for Inuit people are between 5 to 25 times higher than the national average, and these numbers tend to be even worse for Inuit youth. 
Brian Pottle is the president of the National Inuit Youth Council, and he says growing up in an isolated and remote northern community can be very challenging for a young person. And you're a child and you have no executive decision-making functionality, then it becomes very hard, you know, to feel like you can change the situation you're in. And especially when you're confronted with very modern tribulations of being subjected to social media all the time, where you're always seeing this, like the, the best of the people's lives, you know, traveling the world, going super uh, exotic places that are well removed from your remote community that you grew up in. Elder Ripa Evick Carlton also spoke at the event. She says colonization led to a loss of identity and created a sense of hopelessness for many Inuit people. Uh, and then we were forcefully moved or relocated when I was about six years old. So uh, things really began to change for us. All of the, the changes has not always been good. A lot of them had negative impacts, like I'm talking about the forced relocations, the residential school. Pottle also speaks from experience as his brother committed suicide. He says tackling the problem as a whole and all at once is too much. But there are some simple solutions that could have maybe helped people like his brother. Well, if there's subsidized mental wellness travel, well, then maybe the fact that you aren't able to make money or your money that you do make goes to supporting your family, maybe siblings or whatever, then at least you know that there is that potential way of, of removing yourself from a very horrible situation if you find yourself in one. And Eva Carlton says she just wants to get out the message to young Inuit people to never give up hope. There are always brighter days ahead. Oh, there's things uh, young people uh, have a lot more access than I did when I was a young person. I encourage them to, to go forward because you know, there's a lot of support too around now, not like it was back in my time. So go for it. You know, the sky's the limit. You have it within you to, to really make a difference. A World Suicide Prevention Day event will also take place Saturday in Iqaluit at 1.30 p.m. local time. Fraser Needham, AP10 National News, Ottawa. We always like to remind you that if you're experiencing emotional distress and you want to talk, you can call the Hope for Wellness helpline at 1-855-242-3310. We need to take a break, but there's still lots more news still ahead, so stay with us. With less than a month left before groundbreaking begins on a controversial hospital expansion project in Montreal, a group of Mohawk mothers is taking the issue to court, hoping to force an injunction and a ground search for human remains. Here's Lindsay Richardson with that. All is quiet here at the former Royal Victoria site, as it has been since the hospital closed its doors in 2015. But in about a month's time, groundbreaking on a restoration and expansion project will begin. Well, not if the Mohawk mothers of Ganawage have their say. It has bothered us and it continues to play on our minds. And, and so now, you know, it, we believe in what you call action, that you have to do something. And we are doing something. When filing the request for an injunction earlier this month, the Mohawk mothers came with this explanatory document in hand. The site of the former Allen Memorial Hospital is infamous for having been the setting of Dr. Ewan Cameron's CIA-funded MK Ultra mind control experiments of the 1950s and 60s. For over a year, a research team assisting the Mohawk mothers have been working on a timeline to convince a judge there are possibly Indigenous children buried on the site. This is what we needed to communicate with this court and we can't let this construction that's gonna that's gonna totally desecrate not only not only uh, the 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 spiritual aspect of it and and the children or the people that are buried there, but also the forensic evidence that's that's there. 
What they're presenting is extensive evidence of historical medical abuse of indigenous peoples and evidence that Gunawage children were possibly involved in behavioral studies at the Allen Memorial around the same time as Cameron's MK Ultra tenure. According to the document, the institutionalization of indigenous people in psychiatric wards and clinics was often used as a form of punishment or an attack on traditional segments of indigenous communities in Canada and the United States. The mothers do not list specific names, dates or examples of indigenous participation in MKUltra experiments. However, they say their investigation is complicated by the scarcity of archival evidence. So to bolster their cause, they've included a signed affidavit from Lana Ponting, a survivor of the Montreal MK Ultra experiments, now living in Winnipeg. I saw Indigenous children. I saw Dr. Cameron give them Kool-Aid, and the Kool-Aid was laced with LSD. It was horrible to watch these children fall down. The Mohawk Mothers are not the only community group putting pressure on Montreal and the McGill University Health Centre to stop development in favour of ground searches. In late August, the family members of Allen Memorial survivors, Ponting included, submitted a second written appeal to the Mayor of Montreal, saying it's horrific to consider development on a potential burial site. They feel McGill and the city both have a moral and probably legal duty to conduct a thorough and comprehensive investigation of the hospital grounds. The survivors are asking for a meeting with the city, while the Mohawk mothers, as the self-appointed custodians of the land, are asking for a total surrender of the site. We have a hearing before October, but McGill has already announced that they're going to go ahead anyway and start excavating, so we have to do this before that happens. A McGill University spokesperson told APTN News they cannot comment on matters before the courts, but clarified in an email they remain committed to collaborating with governments and Indigenous community leadership to undertake the work necessary to investigate this concern. Meanwhile, the infrastructure group responsible for the site's development says steps are currently underway to identify the best approach to shed light on the allegations of unmarked graves in the area, including possible archaeological excavations. A judge is expected to rule on the injunction application before the end of October. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Montreal. Universities in Canada are reckoning with how to verify Indigenous heritage as they try to hire more equitably. Freelance journalist Michelle Siza was in the communications department at uh, Vancouver's Emily Carr University when questions began to emerge about the heritage of one of their professors. She wrote a bombshell cover story for Maclean's magazine about her experience. She spoke with Dennis Ward about it. Michelle, thanks so much for joining us and for your work there. Uh, first off, can you tell us a bit about the story you wrote for McLean's? Yeah, so thank you so much for having me. Uh, the story that I wrote for McLean's is about a faculty member at Emily Carr University where I was an employee from 2018 until February of this year. Uh, her name is Gina Adams and she was hired in 2019 as part of an effort to increase Indigenous faculty represent at the university um, and after she was hired there were some questions raised about whether her indigenous ancestry claims were truthful um, and as an employee at the university I kind of had a, a front row seat to how the situation was handled and that's what I tried to explore in my piece for McLean. Yeah, like you mentioned, you were an employee. Uh, you write this with a view from inside the institution, a unique uh, perspective for sure. Uh, what struck you the most about how the university handled the questions? I think what struck me most is that there was no real process in place to address a question like this. So Emily Carr is not the only university that's tried to uh, hire more Indigenous people in recent years. That's been a real effort, not just in academia, but in all kinds of sectors. Um, and, you know, I think they're also not the only institution that's grappled with this kind of fallout from that decision. But I, I really realized while I was there that there was no process in place to address um, a question or a controversy like this. So, you know, I assume if a faculty member was hired um, on the basis of having a PhD in mathematics and someone claimed that they didn't really have that PhD, there'd be a process for contacting you know, the university that granted their degree and asking for a transcript, there would be some kind of clear way to investigate and come to a conclusion. And in this case, it just seemed like there was no roadmap for the university to follow 
and there was real uncertainty about what to do. And I think that led to a kind of paralysis um, that's explored in the piece because there was quite a long interval between the initial questions being raised and um, Gina Adams' resignation, which happened just a couple weeks ago. Having dug into all of this, uh, what were some ways that the university could have better responded to all of this? You know, it's it's hard to say in hindsight, and I'm really sympathetic for the fact that universities and any institution dealing with this are in an incredibly difficult position because, um, like I say, there's no roadmap and nobody wants to put a foot wrong. Uh, and I, I really recognize that I think a lot of institutions and a lot of institutional leaders are concerned about, you know, furthering colonialism or racism by putting Indigenous people and their identities on trial. So I think it's really challenging. But one thing that I was really struck by is there were a lot of questions coming from Indigenous members of the community, and they were they were really fundamental questions to how Indigenous people situate our identities. So asking, you know, where are you from? Who are your family? Who claims you? Um, pretty pretty basic introductory questions that weren't really given space to be asked publicly. There was no ability to um, to talk about them within the institution. And and I think, you know, if institutions want to indigenize, if they want to make their spaces safer for indigenous people, if they want to have room for indigenous knowledge and epistemologies, then they have to also accept indigenous ways of doing things and, and give indigenous communities a voice, particularly when those communities are being represented by faculty members who who claim to be members. I guess so. You know, how can institutions handle the? You know, a lot of Indigenous people, their history is complex due to colonialism. The sixty scoop just being one of those things. Is that a, a tough road for an institution to walk as well? Yeah, absolutely, it is. I mean, I think maybe the the mistake that some institutions made was thinking that this would just be a simple process of hiring people and who say that they're indigenous and letting the representation do a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, you know, those histories are really complex. I think a lot of institutions maybe haven't grappled with what they're trying to do by increasing indigenous representation or who who they're trying to represent. You know, is it about engaging with local host nations? Is it about um, increasing representation of indigenous people who have been excluded from the academy um, or who have faced racism for being visibly indigenous? Um, is it about economic equity or educational equity? I mean, I think those are complicated questions and it, it's hard to answer. And, and one of those questions is, you know, how important is it if somebody has lived experience of, uh, you know, of being an indigenous person, how important is it that they have a connection to the community they say they come from or they have indigenous knowledge to share? Is it just a question of ancestry and of ticking a box or is there something deeper that they're looking for? And I think uh, institutions have to, have to grapple with those questions too. Lots of questions, a, a big conversation to have. Uh, Michelle, yeah. uh, we'll have to leave it there though, but appreciate you taking some time for us and again for the article. Yeah, thank you so much. We asked Emily Carr for an interview and they sent us a statement saying in part, ECU is committed to reconciliation, indigenization and decolonization. And that includes our approach to hiring indigenous faculty members according to best practices, which continue to evolve. And they say that Gina Adams is no longer with the university, which we just heard uh, as she has resigned. We have to take one more break, but there's still news ahead. So stay with us. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. Linda Epp shared this great shot from hole 18 at one of Whistler's Frisbee golf courses. Beautiful view. Thanks for sharing, Linda. Email your photos to share at aptn.ca to be featured as our next photo of the day. Let's take a look now at tomorrow's weather. On the East Coast, we've got 15 in showers for St. John's, 22 in sunshine for Halifax. Kujuak 12 with showers. Nixwak, a mix of sun and cloud, 12 degrees there. Saguenay, sunshine and 28 degrees, 30 in sunshine for Montreal. 28 in sunny for North Bay and Peterborough, 18 with a chance of showers for Sault Ste. Marie. 20 in sunny for Sioux Lookout, Capus Casing, showers and 17. 11 in showers for Puckettawagan and Churchill, 17 for Norway House and God's Lake, sunny skies there. 20 and sunny for Gimli, Winnipeg, Brandon. 23 in sunshine for Swift Current and Regina. 22 in sunny for Buffalo Narrows, 16 in sunshine for Stony Rapids. 
for Chippewa, 20 and sunny sky. Same with you in high level. Sun continues in the south. Uh, Red Deer and Edmonton, both 25, 24 in Medicine Hat. 28 in Sunshine for Kamloops and Penticton. Bella Coola, 27 and sunny. 17 for Prince Rupert and Sunny Skies. 20 in Sunshine for Fort Nelson. Old Crow showers and 11 degrees. Whitehorse, sunny and 16. 18 and Sunshine for Wrigley Wati. Some showers and 15. Inuvik showers and 9 degrees. Politak, 8 degrees and sunny. Baker Lake, 8, and Cloud New Yacht, same with you. Same with you in Tallyoke and Joe Haven. And then in Clyde River, we got a little mix of sun and cloud and 7 degrees. It's already a few weeks into the new school year in the Yukon, and for eight schools in the territory, there's a new First Nations school board, too. Sarah Connors gives us a glimpse of how learning is different now that the board is up and running. Using a little bit of glue and a whole lot of moss, these grade six and seven students at Dakini Elementary and Whitehorse are getting hands on learning about the land they live on. For the last two weeks, they've been building birdhouses with materials used from nature. So far, the activity has been a hit with students. Really fun, honestly. And I, I really like just, I don't know, putting random things on it. So, yeah. It was really fun. It was so fun. Yeah. yeah. This is just one of many land-based projects that will take place this school year thanks to the territory's new First Nations school board. The board became fully operational this month in eight Yukon schools and is open to all students. Teacher Brendan Morfitt says the project reflects the board's ultimate goal of empowering students by incorporating First Nations culture into the classroom. And this project here, I think, exemplifies that. Um, getting them out hands-on, connecting with nature, seeing how this project ties into, you know, our ecosystems, um, all kind of blends into what the school board is looking to promote. The board was created after two Auditor General reports found the education system was not meeting the needs of Indigenous students. Teacher Brendan Morfitt says he's seen some students struggle in the classroom, and projects like these are a great way to get them to engage. We know this, that not every student or child is someone who wants to sit at the desk and open a book and read and do math. Um, there's different styles of learning. So it's been a really busy three weeks, and, uh, but it all very exciting and we're supporting as much as we can where we can. Melissa Flynn is the board's executive director. She's hopeful students will be able to see themselves and their culture better reflected in the classroom as they move through the school system. We want this year to see connection to community and connection to land. And so that is, those are wherever teachers are at in their curriculum delivery, uh, in their classroom environments. How can we take it one step further in connection to land, connection to community? For students at Dakini Elementary, connecting to the land is just as important as learning in the classroom. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. Well, that is all the time we have for your news tonight. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Happy Friday. I will see you back here tomorrow with your APTN News Weekend.